Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Monica Pika. I'm with Saks Healthcare, and I'll be your technical producer for today's webinar. Firstly, on behalf of Philips and Saks Healthcare Communications, we want to thank all of you, all of our frontline workers in this audience, for your continued commitment in helping all of us through this pandemic. And before we do get started, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping details. Today's webinar is being recorded, and an online archive of today's event will be available soon after the session. You may ask a question at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Q&A box located on the right side of your screen and pressing Enter. Our speakers will try to answer as many questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. If you do experience technical difficulties, please use the Tech Support tab also located on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you have trouble seeing the slides at any time during the presentation, please press F5 to refresh your screen on your PC or Command R if you're using a Mac. And please make sure you are not behind a firewall to view and participate in this webinar. Our moderator is Bob Campbell. Bob is currently the National Ventilation Specialist for Philips Healthcare. He has presented and lectured at many regional, national, and international meetings and has authored numerous publications and book chapters. He is an active member of the American Association for Respiratory Care and the Ohio Society for Respiratory Care. His research interests concentrated on mechanical ventilator technology and application, ARDS treatment strategies, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. Welcome. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate that uh, kind introduction. And uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. And thank you so much for joining this webinar. I'm so excited uh, to participate in this today. And the title of today's webinar is New Strategies in Treating Respiratory Failure, Non-Invasive Ventilation and High Flow Nasal Oxygen as Complementary Therapies. We're so excited to have uh, our great speaker, Dr. Nicholas Hill. And following his presentation, Dr. Hill will be joined with a panel discussion with some international experts in pulmonary care, Dr. Javier Belda from Spain and Tom Perano from Canada. So now I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Hill. Nicholas Hill is a professor of medicine at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts, and his primary research interests include pulmonary vascular biology, therapeutic approaches for clinical and pulmonary hypertension, and evaluating ways of delivering and testing the efficacy of non-invasive ventilation. Dr. Hill has authored and co-authored over 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He uh, was the co-chair of the uh, ERS-ATS Task Force for NIV Guidelines, and he is a member of several professional me uh, medical associations and past president of the ATS. So we're so excited. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for uh, presenting today. On our panel, we have Dr. Belda. He is the professor of anesthesiology at the Department of Surgery at the University of Valencia, Spain. He's a member of the Education and Training Committee and uh, is a past member of the Respiratory Subcommittee and Critical Care Program of the ATS. He has participated in more than 40 national and international projects focused in ventilation strategies for pre prevention and treatment of lung injury. And he has edited over 15 books authored more than 220 research papers, is a reviewer for multiple medical journals, and uh, Dr. Belda has been an invited speaker in more than 500 international conferences and other teaching events. So thank you so much, Dr. Belda, for joining us today. And we also have Tom Perano. Uh, many of you know Tom. He is currently the clinical specialist at St. Michael's Hospital Center of Excellence in mechanical ventilation. He is a registered respiratory therapist. He works at Kingston General Hospital in Ontario and is a research collaborator at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, and he works with Dr. Laurent Bouchard. He is also a lecturer for the Department of Anesthesia, Division of Critical Care at McMaster University, and is currently completing an MSc uh, in epidemiology. He has spoken at more than 50 conferences, authored multiple research, editorial, and textbook articles and chapters, and he has won numerous awards and has been recognized for his excellent contributions to respiratory care. So thank you, Tom, for joining us as well today. So uh, our speakers uh, each have disclosed with us the following relevant financial relationships. So you could read those here, and those will be part of the archive slide deck as well if you'd like to follow up with that. 
Today's um, program is approved for one con contact hour of continuing education for both nurses and respiratory therapists. A link to obtain your credit will be available at the end of the webinar. And so this is uh, the support statement here. And we'd like to thank Phillips Healthcare for support for this educational activity. So with that, I would like to turn this over to uh, Dr. Nicholas Hill. Thank you, Nick, for joining us today and presenting. Thank you, Bob, for those very nice introductions and uh, good afternoon to everybody listening in or whatever greeting is appropriate for your time zone. It is my honor to give this talk today and, and to participate with such outstanding co-panelists. We're going to be talking uh, about strategies and treating respiratory failure, uh, lessons learned from COVID and NIV and high flow as complementary therapies. Upon completion of this activity, uh, you will be able to discuss indications for non-invasive ventilation and high flow, compare and contrast physiologic actions of non-invasive and high flow, describe ventilatory approaches to management of COVID, and demonstrate how high flow and NIV can work in tandem. What we're going to do is start with some technical considerations, comparing and con contrasting NIV, uh, some of the, the physiologic aspects of, of their mechanism of action, evidence for clinical applications, including COVID, and use of high flow during NIV breaks, and then uh, winding up with some practical considerations. So first with some technical aspects, uh, one of the, the major characteristics, of course, of, of high flow is that it is heated and humidified uh, to body conditions. Uh, and that's it's one of its most important attributes. With non-invasive ventilation, uh, we generally heat and humidify, but uh, it, that's variable. And sometimes we don't need to use heat or humidification, for example, in patients with acute pulmonary edema who's secretions are already uh, quite moist. But perhaps the, the major difference between NIV and high flow, at least with regard to their physiologic actions, is that non-invasive ventilation is preset inspiratory and expiratory pressure. And when used to treat respiratory failure, uh, I generally, non-invasively, I generally include CPAP here as well but uh, it's about the pressure. And with, uh, with regard to flow, uh, it's variable with non-invasive pressure limited approaches because uh, the flow varies to maintain the preset pressures. With regard to high flow, it's about the flow. We set preset a continuous flow uh, that depending on the manufacturer, can range from 20 to 80 liters per minute. And the pressure varies uh, depending on the, the rate of flow uh, and the ventilatory pattern of the patient. We use either single or double ventilator circuits with non-invasive ventilation, but with high flow, it's a single heated circuit and it's a very leaky system. Oxygen is either bled in or, or blended uh, with non-invasive ventilation. Most of our acute non-invasive ventilators will have a blender uh, and with high flow, the, there's a blender which can range from FiO2 equivalent to room air or up to, to 100% uh, with both NIV and high flow. So one of the things that, that I, I mentioned that distinguishes high flow is the heat and humidification. And it's, it's very important because it enhances, enhances the comfort and tolerance compared to standard oxygen and NIV uh, by virtue of its air conditioning. If a dry gas was directed into our, our nose at flow rates of 60 or even 80 liters per minute, we would rapidly desiccate our mucosa, which would give us a sensation of burning and, and uh, it's quite uncomfortable. So it's extremely important for the tolerance of, of it. The inter interface 
shown on the right here is loose fitting, compact, very unlikely to give you claustrophobia, and it permits speaking and eating relatively unimpeded. Whereas uh, here I've given Butterball the cat as my example, but a standard full mask uh, is can be uncomfortable and can induce claustrophobia. Now, as far as the physiologic effects are concerned, as I mentioned with high flow, a lot of it has to do with the flow. But first, uh, the heat and humidification helps to preserve mucociliary function of the upper airway and hydrate secretion. So there is a secretion removal enhancement effect. It's also an effective oxygenator, partly because it keeps up with inspiratory flow rate, which can be up to 60 or more liters per minute in a patient with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. So be, being able to provide flow rates in that range reduces the entrainment of room air, whereas standard oxygen generally peaks out at around 15 liters per minute. So when you're using uh, a non-rebreather mask, for example, there tends to be a lot of room air entrainment uh, so you maintain a better FiO2 with high flow. Also, uh, during expiration, rather than fill the nasopharynx with the just exhaled gas containing CO2, during exhalation, high flow flushes out at least part of the, the nasopharynx and enriches the oxygen and removes CO2 from the, the next, the first part of the, the inhaled breath, thereby reducing dead space and improving ventilatory efficiency. There's also a positive expiratory pressure with high flow. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, but studies do show that it increases expiratory lung volume and may contribute somewhat to an improvement in oxygenation in hypoxemic patients. It also pretty consistently decreases respiratory rate, which reduces work of breathing per minute. To illustrate the flushing effect, um, I show a figure here from an experimental study done on plastic models of the human upper airway uh, copied from upper airway CT scans. And what you're seeing here in the red is a radio labeled gas in this artificial upper airway. Uh, while different flow rates of high flow are uh, delivered, ranging from 15 up to 45 liters per minute over a period of time ranging from half a second to two seconds. And if we look at say 45 liters per minute, the highest flow given here, after one second, you can see that there's considerably more clearing, meaning uh, the red is removed and is replaced by grayness uh, compared to, say, 15 liters a minute, where very little red is removed, or 30 liters per minute, which is intermediate. The point here is that uh, the dead space removal effect, the flushing out, is related to the dose response of flow rate. You need to give at higher flow rates to maximize the flushing effect. Uh, and so I say, if you're gonna use high flow, use high flow, meaning that uh, I generally will start patients off at, at 50 liters a minute and sometimes move up to 60 liters a minute or higher if they tolerate it. Uh, but if, if they're having trouble with tolerance, of course you can titrate it downward as well. Now this is to illustrate the, the contrast between non-invasive ventilation and high flow with regard to uh, nasopharyngeal pressures. Uh, in the, on the green tracing here, uh, this is from a study looking at changes in nasopharyngeal pre pressure during high flow administered at 60 liters a minute. And what we have is a dip during inspiration and then it actually peaks during early expiration, not end expiration, and that's because the expiratory flow rates are highest early during inspiration, and the exhaled hair, air essentially collides into the inflowing uh, high flow gas, uh, 
and you get a, a maximal pressure effect. And then as expiratory flow rate tapers off, so does the expiratory pressure until the next inspiration. If the patient pulls hard enough, it could the pressure could actually go negative. In this case, it's around two centimeters per, per minute, two centimeters of water pressure. And then um, the peak pressure during high flow here is about six centimeters of water, which is corresponding to the 60 liters. So you're getting about one centimeter water pressure for each liter, 10 liters per minute of high flow. And if the mouth opens uh, as much as 50%. In contrast with non-invasive ventilation, you get the set fluctuations here between six centimeters expiratory. So uh, the, the uh, tracings are superimposed early during expiration. And then with inspiration, you go to the target 12 centimeters of water that was set here and you cycle back and forth. And you can uh, appreciate that the mean airway pressure uh, is going to be higher with non-invasive ventilation, uh, in this example, probably seven to eight centimeters, as opposed to high flow, where it's probably in the range of three or four centimeters. And this will vary depending on the pressures you set, of course. But this means that non-invasive ventilation in patients who are quite hypoxemic will most often be a better way of oxygenating because you get it a higher mean airway pressure that is sustained because that's the target you set and uh, a, a better uh, mean airway pressure generally means improved oxygenation. So with non-invasive ventilation, um, as I said earlier, it's about the pressure and the two main indications, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure and acute respiratory failure with cardiogenic pulmonary edema relate to the effect. With acute hypercaptic respiratory failure during COPD, uh, these, the expiratory pressure will counterbalance auto PEEP, and the higher inspiratory pressure uh, serves as almost a power steering effect, if you will, um, at, during inspiration as, as it relieves the uh, need to apply force from the diaphragm and other inspiratory muscles. During cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the effect is more uh, re-inflating collapsed alveoli and improving oxygenation and lung compliance that way. And also there's a cardiotonic effect, an afterload reducing effect of the increased intrathoracic pressure. I served on the task force for NIV guidelines. It was published in the ERJ 2017. Um, and in that, we came up with the conclusion or not to make any recommendation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure applications of NIV because the, the evidence at the time was too conflicting. Uh, but some people have interpreted this as we said it was contraindicated. That is not the case. In fact, we gave conditions where you might consider a trial of NIV in such patients, but we just couldn't make a, a recommendation uh, based on the, the lack of, of evidence available at the time. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, the some of the evidence very selectively uh, with regard to use of various non-invasive means of respiratory support. Um, and I'm going to make comments about what we've learned during COVID. But to set the table, if, if you will, I'm going to talk about a couple of studies done during pre-pandemic times. And, one of the most notable studies uh, that looked at this uh, was that by Fratt et al., the Florali trial that was performed in ICUs in France and in Belgium. And they randomized high flow starting at 50 liters a minute, 100%, versus standard oxygen um, NRB type mask up to 15 liters a minute, and then non-invasive ventilation given by face mask targeting seven to 10 milliliters per kilogram, starting with an FiO2 of 100%. Uh, they had roughly 300 patients distributed evenly between the groups, and their main outcome variable uh, intubation rate was actually not statistically significantly different, although there was a strong trend favoring high flow. But when they looked at the subgroup with a PF ratio less than 200, uh, 
there was a statistically significant difference. So the more severe patients seem to have a benefit with regard to re reduced intubations, and there were more there were uh, more ventilator free days. And most strikingly, there was a substantial improvement in mortality with a reduction in the ICU that persisted via uh, up to 90 days uh, following the d patient discharge. And here is the, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve corresponding to the mortality uh, where you can see the high flow in red ha having relatively low mortality and then NIV poor mortality even a bit worse than standard oxygen, although that was not statistically significantly different. And one of the things that's remarkable about this study is that NIV was actually used only eight hours a day during the first two days, and high flow was used during those other 16 hours. So in fact, this is a study of the combination of non-invasive ventilation and high flow um, that is part of the, the topic we'll be talking about, the tandem use, although the authors didn't look at it that way, and they, they set it up as comparing NIV versus high flow. Um, and one of the theories about why the mortality was greater was that the tidal volume in NIV was 9.2 mLs per kilogram. The question was, was this excessive? Was it contributing to uh, ventilator-induced lung injury? Uh, but in fact, the authors targeted this level, 7 to 10 milliliters per kilogram, so you could argue if that's the case, they set up non-invasive ventilation for failure here. They did not make measurements of tidal volume during high flow, which is, is difficult to do because of the leakiness. And one other mention, I, or study I wanted to mention very briefly, was the study out of University of Chicago looking at helmet non-invasive ventilation versus face mask non-invasive ventilation published in JAMA 2017 uh, by Patel et al. And this study randomized patients with mainly ARDS or pneumonia and hypoxemic respiratory failure to the helmet as shown here versus standard face mask oxygen. And what they found was a, a dramatic reduction in the need for uh, invasive mechanical ventilation using the helmet, which had a failure rate of 18% versus the face mask non-invasive ventilation, which was uh, 62%. So a, a really striking and, and virtually incredible uh, benefit uh, attributable to the helmet. Um, this has not been, been replicated. Um, but it, it raises the question of whether non-invasive ventilation would actually work quite well if we selected the right interface. So what clinical applications of high flow are supported by evidence? And uh, the, the florality study and some of the other pre-pandemic studies suggested uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure, uh, post-operative cases, there are a number of studies with that, as well as post-extubation. Uh, some studies looking at do not intubate patients where it's better tolerance than NIV makes it a, an attractive choice for palliation. I've mentioned the ability to humidify secretions, and people have used it as a pre-oxygenator uh, during endoscopy. Um, th there have not been guideline committees that have endorsed these applications, but there is some evidence to support them. Uh, there's been discussion about using high flow for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, hypercaptic respiratory failure, and these are the main applications, as I pointed out, for non-invasive ventilation, and I would caution people about using non or a high flow in these patients particularly in the more severe cases. In, in patients with relatively mild conditions, uh, I think high flow would, would be adequate. It clearly is better uh, tolerated. So in patients who are not in, intolerant of non-invasive, uh, probably not. And also use in tandem for high flow with NIV in these patients, I think would be fine. Uh, but 
at, at the more severe levels, the pressure which is responsible for the uh, physiologic benefits of non-invasive ventilation, as I pointed out earlier, uh, I think would become more important and you will have failures of high flow that you can avoid with non-invasive in these patients. Now, getting to the data on, on uh, COVID pneumonia and non-invasive ventilatory techniques or respiratory support, as some people call it, um, I want to point out first that as the pandemic evolved, things changed fairly rapidly. In China, uh, people were using high flow. This is a compilation of five different studies I found in the literature and the ranges of use of high flow. Uh, averaging about 30 percent but ranging for 10 to 64 and a similar amount for for non-invasive uh, but intubation was was the default mode and um, the failure rate of these non-invasive techniques ranged broadly from 70 percent right up to 100 percent and the death rates were quite high uh, averaging about 91 percent among patients who got intubated up to 97 percent. Now when the pandemic hit the U.S., uh, places like New York were reluctant to use non-invasive ventilation approaches because of the generation of aerosol. And so New York Presbyterian, for example, uh, in a study they published, only five percent of patients were put on high flow and uh, three percent on NIV and uh, 79 percent got intubated quite early, and they, in this particular report, they didn't report uh, a death rate because a lot of the patients were actually still in the hospital when the report came out. At Tufts, uh, we, we have not written up our experience in, yet, uh, but we're in the process, but we have, uh, we started out with, with about 41%. At our center, with a lot of experience using high flow, uh, we preferred to start non-invasive non with that, unless the patient needed immediate intubation. And we tended to shy away from non-invasive because of the concerns about aerosol. Uh, we still ran over a 50% intubation rate and our death rates were running about 25%, including the intubated patients, which seems to be close to what most of the centers are getting more recently. Uh, we used hel the helmet in only 1% of our patients. And even though we purchased quite a number, our therapists uh, found them more challenging to use. They, they didn't feel as comfortable as with high flow. Now, there are a, quite a number of studies. I've just selected a few of them to illustrate some points, but uh, one of the earlier studies came out of four ICUs in Paris where they were using high flow initially and very similar to our use, uh, just around 40% within the first 24 hours. And they divided patients into those who received high flow and those who did not receive high flow. This was a letter in the Blue Journal and what happened to the patients not on high flow is not uh, detailed, but in any case, they had similar severely low PF ratios. And after present propensity matching, um, the NIV, the uh, rather the high flow group had reduced rates of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation, but no difference in mortality rates. Then there was a study out of Italy that looked at non-ICU patients, and uh, one of the things they were trying to illustrate here was that you could treat these COVID patients outside of the ICU until they got sicker and thus conserve ICU beds and uh, equipment such as ventilators. And in this study, uh, high flow was used in a quarter of patients uh, the helmet with ad administering CPAP was used in half. And of course, in Italy, there's been a lot of experience going back a couple of decades using the helmet. So uh, they're quite comfortable with it there. And then uh, the, the last quarter uh, went on non-invasive ventilation. And basically, there was not any significant difference between them in terms of intubation rates, length of stay, or mortalities, although the, the high flow was associated with numerically less intubation, rather less mortalities, although it wasn't statistically significantly different. Uh, about 
a quarter of the staff uh, was infected here, and they confuted, con concluded that uh, non-invasive respiratory support is feasible. Uh, the one randomized controlled study that has been published thus far was on, uh, on non-invasive uh, techniques is this by uh, Grieco et al., uh, published in JAMA, and what they showed was uh, randomizing the helmet NIV in high flow. Uh, there were m fewer intubations with, with the helmet, but overall mortality rates didn't differ. And then finally, this is a, 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 an adaptive randomized study out of Great Britain, the recovery study, which was the one that discovered that dexamethasone reduces mortality substantially in moderate to severe uh, COVID pneumonia patients. But here they had 1,272 patients, a, a very large study uh, from 25 different centers. But because the, the, the centers were doing different kinds of non-invasive, uh, the randomization scheme was, was um, quite variable depending on which hospital. So they were, in some hospitals, they were comparing CPAP, high flow, and, and uh, standard oxygen, and others, they were just comparing uh, what they, CPAP versus standard oxygen, or high flow versus standard oxygen. But what they found was that CPAP lowered intubation rate uh, compared to standard oxygen, but high flow did not, and that hospital mortality didn't wasn't affected by w whatever combination they used, uh, and length of stay was no different. Uh, they concluded that CPAP administered via mask lowers intubation rate, but high flow doesn't do any better than standard oxygen. So I don't know about you, but I'm more confused now than I was before the pandemic because uh, there are a lot of inconsistencies in, in this data. The florale said the high flow was was considerably better than non-invasive or, um, or standard oxygen, but uh, these, these subsequent studies are not substantiating that. In fact, here, uh, high flow is performing no better than standard oxygen. Uh, so how do we make sense of all this? Well, the Cochrane uh, database recently published some material on this, and uh, the authors concluded that high flow actually is better than standard oxygen than in a, avoiding intubation, but they couldn't find any other uh, differences that they could support with, with evidence after doing a careful uh, systematic review of the literature. Uh, and so at the moment, w there really is no evidence to tell us that using these non-invasive approaches initially uh, improves mortality over uh, a, a more traditional approach using standard oxygen leading to intubation. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, just high flow during breaks from non-invasive ventilation. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to this slide, um, which illustrates the, the main finding. Uh, what we did was select patients who had been put on non-invasive ventilation. And when they were put on breaks, they were randomized either to high flow or standard oxygen with a hypothesis that high flow would uh, lengthen breaks and reduce the need for use of non-invasive ventilation. But during these breaks, we found that high flow in red uh, reduced the increase in respiratory rate and the increase in dyspnea that occurred during standard oxygen. And there was a strong tendency for improvement in uh, or lengthening the break time and comfort was better with high flow than with standard oxygen and i think these are uh, pretty compelling differences uh, in terms of you know what to use during these breaks to use uh, niv and uh, high flow in a, in a complementary fashion and there were a couple of other things eye irritation less was was less with high flow 
Uh, there was less difficulty breathing and uh, less nasal discomfort, although that did not reach statistical significance. So when you, when you put someone on high flow, as I said, I generally will start with 50 liters a minute. If you're going to use high flow, use high flow um, and uh, start with an oxygenation level uh, that is uh, adequate to fully oxygenate the people. And people with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, you're going to start with 100%. If they're not so severe, uh, you might start a little lower. And generally, you, I would start with 37 degrees, so that's fully air conditioned. But I might lower to to uh, 34 degrees um, if pa a patient is intolerant of the heat. So to summarize, high flow is effective for hypoxemic respiratory failure related to pneumonia ARDS, but superior already to non-invasive ventilation or or other uh, modalities it has, is not clear and uh, remains to be established. Uh, high flow also has a role in hypoxemic patients who are at risk post-extubation or in DNI patients. Uh, NIV, because of the pressures, is better at oxygenating, but high flow is better tolerated. And studies from COVID have not clarified things. It's unclear whether the face mask versus helmet NIV versus CPAP versus high flow, which of those combinations is superior. And probably no single one is best for all patients. Advantages to complementary use with NIV are more comfort, less dyspnea, and tachypnea compared to standard ox oxygen, as I just showed you in our study. Uh, clearly, more studies are necessary. So I will stop there and I will thank you for your attention and uh, it is now time to move on to our discussion session. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Dr. Hill. That was fantastic. Very much appreciate that presentation. Very well conceived and uh, presented. So uh, yeah, now to start off the uh, panel discussion, um, I'd like to first go to you, Tom, and uh, ask you a question. So again, for everyone on the line, thank you so much for your attention here. And remember, you could just type in a question in the question and answer. We've had many so far. And so a lot of the questions concern uh, issues that folks may have at the bedside around the infectiousness or transmissibility of COVID. And so, Tom, I know you've done some uh, advanced look looking into this. Uh, and so are there different uh, precautions that we need to take place or institute in order to provide these kinds of uh, uh, therapies at the bedside? And can you maybe comment a little bit on the aerosol generation versus dispersion aspect? of these techniques as well. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Rob. I think this was a very, a very big misconception at the beginning of the uh, pandemic and, and even now uh, with many infection control practitioners. Um, but a lot of the data surrounding the infectiousness or at least the aerosol generation, um, really the concerns came about during SARS, the SARS-1 uh, breakout that occurred. Um, a lot of the data coming out of Toronto actually where I was working, where healthcare workers were getting infected with SARS-1 at the time. Um, so there was this huge fear with non-invasive ventilation that people would be, um, again, at higher risk of getting infected. And I can tell you by, you know, working and living through that uh, in Toronto, uh, our PPE practice was not uh, up to par as it is now. Uh, there were other studies out of China at the time that did not show this increase in infectiousness or transmission to healthcare workers, although it does happen. Um, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't in any different. Um, so... The biggest concern has been whether or not it generates aerosols or actually disperses uh, aerosols that are already there. And this is the big misconception. And so far the data is, although it was scarce at the beginning, it is still growing and it is very consistent that non-invasive strategies such as BiPAP or high flings of cannula do not increase aerosol production. So they are not AGMP, but they do disperse greater than things like helmet or intubation. So intubating someone or providing helmet does reduce dispersion uh, quite significantly. 
Uh, however, high flow nasal cannula, for example, is not much different than standard nasal cannula when it comes to dispersion, and it's actually not much different than NIV as well. So if you're delivering um, either nasal cannula or a Venturi style mask that has high flow, the dispersion of the aerosols that are generated by patients coughing, talking, whatever, um, it's actually not an increase in AGMP. So the dispersion is there, the risk is there, and we probably shouldn't treat patients on high flow different than we are treating the patients on Venturi mask or non-rebreather mask or nasal cannula. We should treat them all with the same precautions. So I'm not saying to not be precautious or careful of uh, infectiousness, uh, but clearly don't assume that patients not on high flow or NIV uh, are at less of a risk of transmitting a virus to you. you we should take care for any patient that is receiving um, oxygen strategies um, and extra flow at the face, essentially. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Belda, um, we've had some questions and also being from Spain, you may have a different experience. And so I'd like to have you give your insights into how do you decide which therapy to start off with? And then how do you determine, you know, when to escalate therapy or, or even de declare that it is the patient is not responding and then uh, further escalate that care? So I'd like to get your insights on that. Well, uh Thank you very much for the question. I, we have been using high flow since many, many years ago. So, and we, we realized that, uh, uh, let's say that there is no contraindication for star therapy with high flow. Uh, any respiratory failure arriving to our intensive care deserve starting with high flow. I mean, apart from those cases that are clearly into where clearly intubation is uh, is uh, is um, important, but uh, for the rest of the people who we used to start with non-invasive ventilation, today we start with high flow nasal cannula because it's uh, because the comfort of the patient. So and then if we we have to think in the benefits of to add some positive pressure so the point is that starting with a high flow let's say if your device permits go to 60 liters per minute and then uh, looking at the tolerance we reduce the flow and if the flow goes down to 30 we feel that the positive pressure is not there anymore and we have to think to increase the uh, uh, to escalate the therapy to non-invasive ventilation however uh, using non using high flow for starting the treatment in those patients with uh, let's say mild or acute respiratory failure we have to monitor a very close monitor the monitoring these patients uh, we have the the rocks index which is uh, i mean correct for these patients but it, it doesn't really matter o oxygen saturation in relation to fio2 and also the pnea score and also their uh, the uh, respiratory rate is enough to see if the patient is improving in the first half an hour first half an hour is crucial for any patient and if you observe that the patient is improving wait wait another half an hour and then another hour and so and so on but uh, looking at the first half an hour and if you feel that the oxygenation is not improving clearly why not to start zip up so what you lose is the comfort but you have to treat the patient first so in the first half an hour of the first hour the patient is not clearly improving you have to start zip up because with zip up or bipap you know exactly what is the pressure that you are applying and what is the pressure that the patient needs so i think that uh, high flow is maybe at the starting point but with close monitoring of the patient and then you know to I mean, rapidly in escalate the therapy to zip up or bipap uh, if the patient is not improving, uh, I mean, fast. Bob, is it okay Excellent. if I ask uh, Dr. Bildo a quick question? For sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if you would consider 
a contraindication to high flow and to other non-invasive approaches. Uh, the issue of delaying uh, a needed intubation. You know, the, the, the biggest risk is using it when the patient needs to be intubated. What do you think about that? No, that, that's totally correct. But I think that the point is not in the technique, but it's on you. So if you careful monitor the patient and you know exactly if the patient is improving or not, it's not because the therapy, the therapy is there and the effect is there. You you tell you have you 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 tell us the uh, uh, the what are the effects and the effect is not. I mean, having the effect that you expect, please uh, uh, go to the non-invasive. So helmet or CPAP with mask, but. Uh, is the I have I, I haven't seen I was about to ask you if you see any contraindications for non-invasive ventilation. We haven't we have seen just in one occasion an uh, uh, emphysema subcutaneous subcutaneous emphysema in the nose, but, but very very small, so very light. So I, ha I have, we haven't seen any contraindications in there with the hundred of patients I have seen treated with uh, with high flow. So haven't seen clear contraindication except you know rejection or non comfortable pay uh, non comfortable uh, situation. Except of that, the tolerance. Except of tolerance, there is no contraindication for. Uh, high flow. So we will start with close monitoring and then move to another therapy if needed. Rob, if I can just add yeah, on I, to, I uh, to... I'm sorry, Tom, go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I would just, I just want to highlight uh, or combine two of the statements that uh, Dr. Hill and Dr. Belda brought up. Um, so first off, Dr. Belda mentioned, you know, 30 minutes, hours. Traditionally, non-invasive respiratory strategies, whether it's high flow or BiPAP, the success of these therapies have traditionally been measured in minutes and hours, not days. And I, I want to highlight that. We know if the strategy is working very quickly, not five days from now. Uh, and in fact, if the patient is worsening over days, it's a strong signal that the therapy is not doing what it's intended to do. Um, the other thing is about uh, what Dr. Hill mentioned about delaying intubation. I think in the onset of the pandemic, when there was fear about using these therapies, we were intubating patients very early in some centers globally, N not everywhere. Some places were using high flow and non-invasive strategies, but others were not in going directly to intubation. And there was this big fear that perhaps we were intubating patients too early. And so, you know, there's this big dilemma, like, should we not just go by what we normally would intubate patients by, which is excessive work of breathing, oxygenation needs, respiratory rate, like there's criteria for intubation that many studies have utilized. And I think what's happening is if this was, if that's what, what's in the center was our standard, our clinical practice was somewhere in the center, we were may, maybe moving way too far over uh, and not intubating people, uh, or sorry, intubating people too early. And now instead of going by what we used to do, measuring things in hours uh, rather than days and deciding to intubate, we're now holding off days of people failing strategies before we intubate. And I think we don't know early versus late with COVID-19 yet, but I think that we need to remember that intubation criteria exists. And I feel like perhaps many people are worrisome of following traditional guidelines um, you know when someone's working really hard on high flow sure try them on non-invasive give that positive pressure but if they're still continuing to work hard and still look like they're actively failing we are doing exactly what uh, dr hill suggested which is perhaps delaying intubation and the the data we have on delaying intubation is not good it, it's not good for the patient uh, so I feel like, um, you know, we need to consider what we do know about managing uh, hypoxemia with non-invasive respiratory strategies. So, sorry, I just wanted to combine those two comments because I think they're extremely important clinically. Excellent discussion. So a lot of questions coming in about uh, proning patients. And so I'd like to start with you, Dr. Hill, and say, uh, are you proning patients um, either on high flow or on non-invasive ventilation? Do you have a preference on which one and, uh, and what's been the response? Uh, we, we are using proning. Uh, and here uh, we're talking about awake proning. 
in people who were on non-invasive uh, techniques. Uh, there's no doubt that high flow is much easier to administer when you're prone a patient than any of the other non-invasive alternatives. Uh, the masks, if someone has a full face mask, uh, you know, the patient's lying on the mask. It's, it's kind of awkward and, and uncomfortable, but it can be done. Uh, likewise with a helmet. Um, you can prone people with a helmet, but again, it's, it's kind of awkward. And, uh, you know, we've, some of the patients we've tried that on have not appreciated it too, too much. Uh, there, there has been some debate about the efficacy of proning, and there are some studies that have come out. Uh, one out of Spain uh, that was published in Critical Care, I think, last year. And, and uh, Javier, you, you were a, a co-author on that one, were you not? Yeah, yeah, there had no difference, you know. I think that the pro improved yeah. the oxygenation early, but because of the prones, you know, not uh, because of the high flow. So the number of intubated patients was the same in both groups. So right, and that that was but a prospective think... study, but not randomized. And exactly, uh, exactly. And more recently, the, there was the study that came out in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, ERMIN, which was a multinational randomized controlled study with 1,200 or so patients. And it showed a benefit of the failure rate in the, NI, in the high flow proning group was uh, 40%, in, which included uh, not only intubation, but, but death. And then in the control group, it was 46% um, people with high flow and not prone. And that was statistically significantly different uh, in favor of high flow with proning. So, you know, I think you could argue that, that, that the evidence base is, is there. Clearly, from a physiologic point of view, you know, you, when you flip a, a lot of these patients, their oxygenation improves significantly. But of course, that doesn't mean that the subsequent outcomes are going to be better because in the ARMA study, you know, oxygenation was better early on in the group that was getting the high tidal volumes, and we know what happened there. So, I th I think the findings of that study are encouraging. I think you know we we need to learn more. One of the limitations of those studies is that it's very hard to uh, measure the, the amount of time that patients are actually spending proning. And uh, neither of those studies, the one you were involved with or, or the more recent uh, Lancet article, actually describe in their methods section ex exactly how they determined the dose of proning. Great discussion, guys. Um, so uh, I'm looking at the time. We'll try to squeeze in a few extra questions. So I know we were talking about the concept of recognizing failure and not delaying um, intubation, but a number of questions are coming in related to um, when you recognize a patient's failing high flow therapy, should we just progress straight to intubate that patient or is there a value to pro uh, giving them a trial of NIV mask ventilation? I'll address Tom first and go around the horn. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading the questions down here and I missed the last part of your question. <laughs> I thought you were directing it at Dr. Hill. Okay, so the que the question is, when you recognize a patient that's failing high flow therapy, is there a benefit to giving them a trial of mask NIV prior to just yes. straight away going to intubate? No, I think I, you know what, I think uh, as as Dr. Hill pointed out, it's it's become probably more confusing now than before. I think pre pandemic we knew that non invasive ventilation for hypoxemic respiratory failure it wasn't recommended against it actually the 2017 guidelines, the combined ATS and ERS guidelines just provided no recommendation for hypoxemic failure. Um, so because we don't really know, the data was sort of all over the place, high failure rates in some studies, lower in others, experience had a huge deal of what to do with it. We know that the degree of hypoxemia uh, when applying non-invasive is also important. Um, but I think in light of some of the data that's coming out, perhaps a short trial and even perhaps trying CPAP um, over, you know, if you're going to advance to non-invasive strategies, even starting off with CPAP 
Because then you, especially if someone's working hard to breathe, there's always been that concern that if someone is actively working hard to breathe and you can't relieve the dyspnea, there's a possibility that you're increasing the transpulmonary stress on the lung if you're providing high inspiratory pressure without a reduction in their drive. If they reduce their drive, then great, you, you, may, you may balance it out. But if you can't reduce that drive, then NIV, again, a short trial. And I think it's important that measuring the success of transitioning to NIV in hours rather than days. Um, so someone who's continuing to worsen after transitioning to NIV, we need to recognize this patient as now probably we're now delaying intubation in this patient. Um, and again, perhaps going with what we used to do, which was decide to intubate a patient who's clearly not benefiting from it, uh, sh sh should be done. But absolutely, a trial of NIV should be should be uh, attempted. I'm, I'm like assuming to, others I, would, I, would agree with this discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. But and also to to highlight that uh, you said that uh, first is high flow, then to move to ZPAP or I even by, by PAP if needed. But uh, uh, never, uh, well, never I, that uh, put them together to put a high flow inside a ZPAP mask. Uh, I think is not no benefit because the benefit that you look for the high flow is a positive pressure uh, would you uh, what you apply when you use a CPAP mask is a known positive pressure so both effects are the same so if you are trying to uh, to wash uh, CO2 why don't use BiPAP but because when you use a ZPAP mask you can use CPAP and BiPAP right just applying pressure. So the, the indication is to, uh, I mean, there is no no reason to use high flow and uh, uh, I mean, upon the high flow as uh, CPAP mask. CPAP will produce the positive pressure, known positive pressure. And if you want to remove CO2, you may apply some BiPAP. But to, I mean, both systems at the same time is, uh, is, uh, is not, uh, is not a good there is no uh, uh, physiological basis so first high flow and then say CPAP or BiPAP excellent yeah and I, so in the interest I, I'm sorry go ahead you're the, no, you're I was the just going to transition real quick and just say there's uh, the, uh, another theme in the questions, and that is a lot of folks are saying, you know, I've got a device that uh, is limited to 40 liters a minute or maybe 60 liters a minute. So I'm going to uh, turn it back to you, Dr. Hill, and say, are, are there times that a patient may benefit from escalating the delivered flow even beyond 60 liters a minute? Um, and, and what your thoughts are on that in terms of patient tolerance or response? Uh, great question. I'd love to know the answer. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, our experience has been mainly with devices that go up to 60 liters a minute, and the ones that go higher are relatively new on the scene. Uh, the V60, for example, has built in high flow, you know, that's the acute non invasive ventilator uh, from Philips, and it does go up to 80 liters a minute. And, uh, we generally, we haven't used it that often. Patients do become intolerant of, of very high flows. And uh, it may be that there, there is a maximum benefit at, given a, a flow rate. It, is 60 better than 40? Yes, I think it is. And, you know, the, the studies that I showed, the, the figure of the flushing out, uh, and we've we've done some work in in COPD patients with different levels, and so I, I do think that's the case. Is 80 better than 60? I don't know, and it, it may not be because at some point, you know, how much more dead space can you blow out? You know? Yeah, and there's two considerations. There's one that the size of the cannula compared to the nair will determine how much pressure is felt by the patient. So when you get into tolerance. You're more. You're going to find way more people intolerant once you get to above 60 for sure. The second thing is humidification. You have to ensure that the humidifier you're using is has specs that can achieve, you know, optimal humidity or the same humidification at higher flow rates. So it's just something to consider from a manufacturing standpoint. Um, but yeah, the there's there's a study in COPD patients. Actually, it was a physiological study just looking at the impact of flow. Uh, done by um, the, the first author's name is Nutopolo 
Ritiami. I always have trouble with his last name. It was a study out of Thailand. And they tried different flow rates from 10 up to 50. And they found 30 liters per minute to be optimal in terms of reducing worker breathing in COPD patients. So I do think that the optimal flow will not only be different based on the size of the cannula or the humidification, but also the, the, the condition in which the patient is presenting with. Um, so yeah, we don't really know the sweet spot, but for hypoxemic respiratory failure, every study that started low and then would titrate upwards ends up around 50 liters per minute. So it's a good comment by Dr. Hill that starting at 50 seems like the most logical decision and then trying to maximize it to the ability of the patient's tolerance and humidification. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, it, it's not a one size fits all situation. You know, there, there are individual characteristics right. that differ between patients that, that were, are going to make different flow rates preferable in, in uh, different patients. Yeah, Great. just, well, in just the to, end. to, okay, just uh, uh, five seconds to say that uh, the, in COVID patients with high flow, the patient was still breathing deeply, you know, what it, with doing a high effort. If he, a uh, higher flow will, would improve these patients. So I, I don't know because we have a limit in the, the bedside because of the machines. But if you see that the, if there is a big effort, try to change the modality because, I mean, if, the, if there is not a good effect, so monitor the patient. And if it's not the good effect, you have to change the therapy, escalate the therapy. It was a, a question from the audience. Excellent, guys. Well, I cannot thank you enough, uh, Tom, Dr. Velda, Dr. Hill. Thank you so much for this great discussion. I wish we had another hour, and I know we could easily uh, have a great discussion ongoing. But in the interest of time, we're going to have to kind of wrap things up a little bit. And I just want to remind everyone and thank you, audience, for, for being here and participating. Great questions. And uh, everybody was so engaged. That's just fantastic. So again, this is a proof for one continuing education credit for both nurses and respiratory therapists. And to, in order to obtain that credit, you will need to go to the website that you see on the screen here, www.saxtesting.com uh, forward slash bo. And then you'll register on the site and then complete a short evaluation of the program. And then once you've completed that evaluation, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. And uh, again, we'd like to thank Philips Healthcare for sponsoring this event. There's also an archived version of this presentation that will be available. So if you didn't get a chance to write down that uh, website for the CEU credit, uh, you can come back into the archive and see that. It'll be posted in just a few days and it will be available uh, again for all of you that are registered or pre-registered for this event, you will receive an email with a link to that archived version. So thank you again um, to the panel and to Dr. Hill for presenting. Thank you, the audience, our bedside heroes, that uh, every day you're bringing your best to the bedside and impacting lives. And so thank you so much for that. And I'd like to turn this back over to uh, Monica for some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And this does conclude our webinar for today. I would like to remind the audience that there is a survey for you to uh, fill out at the conclusion that is popping up immediately. You should see it right now. We would greatly appreciate you sharing your opinion on today's webinar. We do value your feedback. Thank you again. And on behalf of our presenters, Sachs Healthcare Communications, and our sponsor, Philips, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.